He calls it, not after himself, because he was a very quiet, unassuming guy. He called it the Stanford Benet. I've heard people call it the Stamford Benet, with an M. Not true. The university is Leland Stanford, Jr. It's the Stanford Benet. So what happened to poor old Simon? Uh, Simon's name was left off. Simon outlived Benet. Simon went on to run the Simon Institute, which developed tests. One of the things that Simon did was hire a graduating young, young, young biology student who couldn't find a job in biology because he was so young and put him to work uh, establishing norms for tests. And this guy happened to zero in on the kinds of wrong answers that people gave at different ages. Uh, his name was Jean Piaget, uh, as they say in our biology department. His name was Jean Paget, and uh, he developed a stage theory of intellectual development. Just an aside, he worked at his first job was working at the Simon Institute. Back to the Stanford Binet. It produced a score known as an intelligence quotient. What you did was you, you put the person's uh, mental age, was, which was what they scored on the test, over their chronological age, and this was all in months. Then you divided the one by the other, and you would produce a number, and that number would be a reflection of how intelligent you were compared to the general population. The concept was based upon a 1912 suggestion of a German psychologist named William Stern. The test was seen as a global indicator of intelligence. And the test was normed on 500 American children ages 4 through 19. Now, 400 is a decent number. If you are going to develop a questionnaire as part of your dissertation, you need to norm it on 500-ish people. Uh, that's where the, the curves seem to level off. If you test 500, you get no better results than if you had tested 400. Or on the term in revision, he provided clearer, more detailed instructions, and a student of his, Arthur Otis, adapted the test as the Army Alpha and Beta tests. The uh, one was for literates, the other was for non-literates, or the, the non-literate one could be used for non-English speaking uh, people. These and other similar tests had a major impact on psychology and were a new tool in the measure in the measurement arsenal <laughs> in the measurement arsenal, easy for me to say, and a critical ingredient of the child study movement. More numbers to attach to people. The bean counters are going to be very happy. As an offspring of his study, Lewis Terman obtained funding from the Commonwealth Fund of New York City. Now, why New York City would give him money to conduct an experiment in California, I do not know. But Terman's purpose was to locate, with his new Stanford Binet test, to locate 1,000 or more people with IQs of 140 or higher. That 140 is not where genius happens. Uh, that's not the dividing line. 140 is simply, using that normal curve, that's the top 1% of the population. 
moving on. He found 800 males and 671 females, probably proving from then on that males were smarter than females, right? You disagree? Probably more of an indication that more males were schooled in those days than females. Today, he would probably find a lot more females than males. Uh, his subjects had a cute little name. They were called termites. If you were one of those, what is it, 1,471 people, uh, you were a termite. And you took the treatment. In other words, you were given the test, the original survey, plus you got follow-up questionnaires about every 10 to 12 years of your life. And uh, I don't know if the termites are still alive. If they are, uh, they are approaching uh, daughterhood, if you will. I don't know. Let's see. Uh, they'd be in their 90s now. Terman found some ethnic and racial disparities, which raised questions then and have continued to cause problems and confusion and all kinds of nattering. He found a 100% excess of Jewish blood. What does that mean? That means for the population, he found twice as many Jewish kids as the population dictated he should. If, the, if Jewish people were 5% of the population, he should have found 5% of his termites to be Jewish. Instead, he found 10%. He found a 25% excess of native-born parents. Does that mean they are American Indians? No. It simply means that most of his kids were, were children of parents who were born in this country. So uh, immigrants are a little lower on the list than those whose parents were born here. He found, and this one I giggle at every time I see it, he found a probable excess of Scotch ancestry. I suspect he was either Scotch himself or was drinking at the time, or maybe both. I don't know what that means. He found a few more Scots people than he probably ought to have found. Greater deficiency, and this was the bombshell uh, then and now, of Latin and black ancestry. Uh, and we've been fighting that battle ever since. A guy named Mortimer Adler studied the question again in 1967, found an excess of Jewish, German, English, and Scottish folks, and a deficiency of black, Italian, Mexican, and Native American folks. The closer you are to the norming group, the more valid the test is for you. So the test was normed on middle class or upper middle class white kids. It's extremely accurate if you are a middle class or upper upper middle class white kid. It is less valid for anyone who deviates in any way from that particular uh, definition. If you are a black female named Rodriguez uh, in a wheelchair, chances are the, uh, the test is not going to be a very good predictor for you. What do intelligence tests measure? Well, they were designed to measure the probability of school success. That's, that's the original thing in France. Can you develop a test which will show me whether these kids will be successful in school? Yes, they do that fairly accurately. Again, the caveat. The closer you match the characteristics of the norming group. So if you are, once again a middle class or upper middle class, white male probably, then uh, 
then the test is pretty accurate for you. The test is not a good predictor of other factors like happiness, job stability, ability to juggle, and the like. Typical intelligence test contains contain items relating to short-term memory. I can remember uh, the lady, well, I took a test like this in the fourth grade. Uh, I don't know why they picked me to take the test. Maybe they, they thought I needed special education. I don't know. Uh, I was one of three kids from the B group selected to take the test with all of the kids in the A group. Uh, there were items on stringing beads. The teacher said, okay, here, watch me now. And she took this thread and then she put on one round one and two square ones and three triangle ones and backwards and forwards and what have you. And she slowed it up and showed it to me and said, okay, now you do it. And that was a test of short-term memory. They test long-term memory by uh, your vocabulary. The better vocabulary you have, the more you have uh, information stored in your long-term memory. They test for associations. This is to this, that is to that. They showed me pictures of hands and asked me, is this a right hand, is this a left hand? They showed me pictures of pulley systems and saying, which way is the pulley moving the object? They tested reasoning. And the reasoning is, there are two kinds of reasoning. Convergent reasoning. What is the one thing? Or divergent reasoning. Uh, list as many things as you possibly can do with a brick as, as you can think of. And then they tested evaluation, how, how you could put information together. They showed me a picture of a field, said, you lost your wallet some, somewhere in the field. Draw me a path that you will travel in order to find your wallet. That's evaluation. Another thing they asked me was, uh, you are going away on a vacation to a desert island. You could take either your mother or your father. Which one would you pick? And since I didn't want to offend either one, I said, well, my dad is a better fisherman, so he could do that. My mom is a better cook. She could do that. But I wouldn't want to, I wouldn't want to make either one of them disappointed, so I'll take my grandmother. <laughs> I probably scored very high at that particular point in time. That's probably an unusual answer. What are the limitations of an intelligence test? Well, regardless of whether they call it a test or not, intelligence can't really be measured. You can approximate it. Tests only measure a sampling of factors. They surely don't. They don't measure street smarts very much. Scores can change with experience and training, and that's the reason we have programs like Head Start today. The people who do best on, on intelligence tests are the ones who have had the most experiences as kids. If your mom read to you, that's an experience not all kids get. If your mom takes you to museums and theaters, and takes you to zoos, those are, again, experiences that you have that all go, remember that apperception deal, that all goes into your head. It makes you what you are today. So the reason behind Head Start and other programs like it is to give kids from disadvantaged backgrounds experiences that kids from adva advantaged backgrounds would get. And as the sun sinks slowly in the west, we bid a fond farewell, my